Bueno, parece que ya se ha estabilizado el, el, las personas que se están conectando. Eh, vamos, vamos a comenzar. Buenas tardes a todos. Eh, mi nombre es Jesús Vega, soy el Country Manager de Imperva para la Península Ibérica. Eh, me acompaña nuestro CTO, eh, Kunal Anand. Eh, lo primero, bienvenidos y muchísimas gracias por dedicarnos eh, vuestro tiempo. Durante la presentación de esta tarde, eh, Kunal eh, nos dará la visión de ciberseguridad de Imperva eh, en materia de protección del dato y todos los caminos eh, que a este conducen. Eh, creo que la ciberseguridad eh, cobra en los tiempos que vivimos, si cabe, aún más, más relevancia, donde todos aquellos que hemos tenido la oportunidad estamos teletrabajando donde el tráfico de Internet se ha multiplicado, eh, el número de transacciones es, es increíble. Muchos de nuestros clientes, especialmente aquellos que están dedicados en las actividades de e-commerce, han visto incrementos de su tráfico eh, en torno al 50% y el otro día asistía a una sesión de un fondo de private equity que decía que en una de sus participadas habían experimentado un incremento en el número de transacciones online eh, con un multiplicador de 10 comparativamente con el mismo periodo del año anterior. Con lo cual, eh, esto, esto ha acelerado enormemente eh, procesos que se esperaba que consumieran varios años y eso hace que, evidentemente, la ciberseguridad cobre una importancia fundamental ahora mismo. Entonces, antes de dar paso a Cunal, eh, tenéis eh, un panel de preguntas en el cual os agradeceré que vayáis eh, tecleando las preguntas que, que consideréis oportuno. Y después de los 40-45 minutos que durará la sesión de CUNAL, yo mismo le, le trasladaré vuestras, vuestras preguntas. Y después de la sesión, eh, Dani de la Cámara nos dará un rato de asueto en esta vorágine del tele, que el teletrabajo nos ha impuesto. Así pues, eh, insisto, muchas gracias por vuestra, vuestra atención, vuestro tiempo y ya le cedo el turno a CUNAL. CUNAL. Good evening. Good, good evening. Good evening for us. Uh, good afternoon for us. Good morning for you. Thank you very much for uh, joining us. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jesus. Uh, buenas noches. Uh, it's my morning over here, and I actually do speak Spanish. I'm actually um, almost fluent in Spanish, except I've never given a presentation in uh, español um, in for security. So I'm worried that I would make a big mistake or a series of mistakes. With that said. Uh, what I'd love to do today is walk you through an introduction of Imperva. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by giving you an overview of what the company is doing today, what our products and capabilities look like. I want to highlight innovation that we've done specifically around application security. And you're going to see two demonstrations as well. So we have a lot to cover in this presentation. And as Jesus mentioned, we'll be able to answer questions afterwards. So if you have questions throughout the presentation, just go ahead and, and ask. We'll queue them up and then we'll make sure that we answer them at the end of the presentation. So with that, let me go back to my web browser over here and let me get the presentation moving. All right, so the way I wanna start by talking about the company is by starting by really just explaining where we are today as an industry. And what we've observed by working with our customers is that today data is considered to be the crown jewels of every business. And what we've seen, especially over the last months with things like COVID-19, is that more organizations have started to move faster to things like cloud. And they are moving more workloads to the cloud. It could be applications, and it's starting to become data now. And obviously, in, things like, in countries like Spain, you have to worry about things like GDPR. You have to worry about things like privacy and regula regulations regarding data risk. And when we think about the way that regulations and compliance have to be managed, it's typically at odds with security. And what we've noticed over the last, again, few years is that we've seen an increase in the amount of time it takes to do things like remediate data breaches. And as more workloads move to the cloud, we've started to see a big shift in the way that attackers are going after data, specifically by targeting things like applications and APIs. Because if you take a step back, attackers are not going to break applications just to break an application. They're trying to break an application or an API to get access to data. So I've been doing this for about 20 plus years now in this industry. And in this industry, I've noticed for the first time that the more records, more breached records came through applications and APIs than just direct data access. And when we think about the paths to data that exist, you've got threats from the outside of people that are trying to break through, through the network, going through applications and APIs, and ultimately trying to get to data. Or you have people inside the network that may have privileged access that are trying to get access to those apps, those microservices, and data as well. We've highlighted 
the major threats that we see across different areas, as well as the actors. So it could be bad bots and hackers, and we'll talk about bad bots in a little bit, as well as on the other side, you may have people who are malicious, careless, or compromised that are going after all of these entities inside of the organization today. And what we've understood from working with lots of our customers globally is that you don't want another, another vendor that you get to work with. You want a partner that's gonna work with you as you are transformed. And what we've understood is that for the next few years, we're gonna be in a period of, of transition and that transformation where you're gonna go from on-prem to cloud. You're gonna be in this middle state where maybe some of your workloads are gonna be in the cloud, but eventually they all will be. And so we'll need to be able to work with organizations throughout that entire journey. We know that regula regulations and compliance is still extremely important, and that's equally important for us as well, making sure that you as an organization are adhering to things like compliance and regulatory requirements so that you don't have to deal with the costs of non-compliance. And then of course, making sure that you have greater confidence as you deploy the technology, as you deploy the solutions, making sure that you're able to accelerate various parts of your business. So being able to deploy things faster, being able to get ROI faster, not just from us, but through the overall ecosystem that you have. And what we believe that we've done at Imperva is that we built the world's first and only multi-cloud platform that can protect everything from the edge, applications, and data. And the way we think about it is, and you'll see it in a couple of moments, the way we think about it is we've built a unified model that can actually go ahead and reduce risk across the board, and we give everyone complete visibility, and you'll see a unique capability that we've introduced earlier this year around this concept of user to data understanding and tracking, basically understanding how your information is being used, where that information is going, is that information sensitive, all the way through applications and APIs, and you'll get to see that in the live demonstration in a little bit. But when we frame things up at Imperva, the way we like to think about it is, we protect your data and all the paths to it. And when we talk about those paths, those paths could be through the network, could be through applications, could be through APIs. And we've built what we call this comprehensive edge-to-end -end protection today. So a few points on scale. Every month, we stop more than 18 billion attacks. And we process more than 1.5 trillion requests every single month with our global network. We, we see things around 25 petabytes monthly of security traffic. And we save organizations every year more than 4 million work hours, leveraging our insights products, so things like attack analytics, data risk analytics, being able to perform an investigation, and you'll see some statistics around that in just a little bit as well. Now, to go back to what I was calling out before, and I, I intentionally bring this slide back up here again, is bringing up this concept of multi-cloud. This idea of being able to protect your workloads wherever they are, which could be, again, on-prem, could be in the cloud, or could be across multiple cloud environments. As businesses, you're not just going to one cloud, you're leveraging multiple clouds, and you may spread your workloads, you may spread the data across different cloud environments. And we wanna make sure that as a security technology, we can work in all those different environments. And what we built under the hood is products and capabilities that fall into three distinct pillars. What we do in edge, what we do in application, and what we do in data. On the edge security side, it's what we do around DDoS and content delivery. On the application security side, web application firewall, RASP, and you'll see a demo of RASP in a little bit, advanced bot protection, attack analytics. On the data side, we do database activity monitoring, discovery and assessments. We have cloud data security, which is the newest member of the family. And then like attack analytics, we have data risk analytics that collects and puts all these insights together. And because we have all of these sensors, we built a collective risk engine and a global insights engine that is able to look at all this data at scale across all these different capabilities. And you'll see that in a little bit when I get to it in, in a few slides around how we can do all the automation as well as the orchestration around security events that are happening in your environment. And then we go back to the data flow risk diagram that I outlined at the very beginning. You take all of our capabilities that we have today and we can protect all of the paths to data whether it's that bad bot or hacker from the outside, or it's the malicious, careless, or compromised person inside, we have a unique series of capabilities that can see all of the paths to that data and making sure that protection's in place every single step of the way. And you'll see a demo of that capability in a little bit. What I wanted to do is highlight a couple of areas of innovation that we've invested in 
over the last few years, and we've accelerated this innovation over the last few months. Everything I'm going to show you is generally available today. Nothing is nothing is uh, yet to come. Everything you're going to see is real. Everything you're going to see is in the product today. It's what our products are capable of. I'm going to call out where we are going to take these various initiatives as well. And if folks have questions at the end of the presentation, I can answer those as well, specifically around where we're going. I'll start by talking about things like policy management and onboarding. We have a lot of organizations that manage tens of thousands of websites and assets leveraging our cloud WAF today. And what we ended up realizing was we needed to improve the way that policy management worked to make it easier to manage all of the policies across tens of thousands of assets. So we introduced a newer updated way of doing policy management as well as role-based access control that can connect back to your organization. So if you leverage things like single sign-on, we now have that capability to merge back with single sign-on to absorb all of those users and identities, as well as mapping them back to role-based access controls. We've also expanded coverage around various protocols. So TLS 1.3, we added support for gRPC, as well as HTTP 2 end-to-end. And we also heard from our customers that they wanted us to improve around things around certificate management, as well as SIM integrations. On the certificate side, we have a self-serve process, as well as a newer way to do revocations. And then we've also created a newer set of integrations for the SIMs. One-click integrations, and you'll see an integration that I've got in a SIM in my own demo, specifically with Splunk in a little bit. We've also added and introduced newer capabilities around policy management, where you can now do things around simulation. A lot of our customers are curious when they introduce a, a strategy for a blocking or a strategy around security. They're curious around what that's going to do to security traffic. Well, what we ended up doing was introducing this capability, and we started by introducing it into bot management, where today you can see what a, what a mitigation strategy is going to do downstream to your overall traffic before you implement it. So if you want to see if you're going to be able to deflect more attacks, or if you introduce a captcha, or if you do a block, what that's actually going to do to the number under the hood. So we've made big improvements in the way that organizations can understand what something is going to do before you actually put it into production and before you turn the switch on. Now, I want to highlight something that's really important for us, which is the introduction of advanced bot protection. Last year, we did a big acquisition of Distill Networks, the leader in bot management. And what we ended up doing was acquiring them and putting them into our single stack proxy. And we've expanded all of the use cases. We can do things like account takeover, credential stuffing, card fraud. We've introduced a capability around client-side protection, which we're really excited about, as well as DDoS and scraping too. So really expanding the number of use cases that we're seeing on the bot side. We introduced the bad bot report earlier this year, which is our big threat research report around bots. We highly recommend that you take a look at that. And between Asus and the team, we'll make sure that you all have a copy of that bad bot report as well. We think it's really important to look at because we're seeing a big surge in bot traffic, especially over the last few months with COVID-19. Now, what we've done is we've integrated bot protection into our proxy, as well as we've built connectors. So for things like AWS or Cloudflare, or Fastly, F5 or Nginx, if you, if you have workloads that maybe use some of these other capabilities, we've built connectors that can work with every single one of those. So you can get Imperva bot management truly anywhere and everywhere. And finally, we created a programming language. We believe so much in bot protection that we built a programming language. We call it Morphine. And it's state-of-the-art client-side obfuscation. We developed it internally. At some point, we will open source it. But we leverage this to do obfuscation that runs on the client side. And we have big customers today that are taking advantage of this to make sure that things like classification and that challenges can't be tampered or, or, obfusc or taken advantage of by attackers inside the web browser. One area that we added a lot of capability into is around custom reporting. So we've taken and we've built out the ability for customers to create custom dashboards around this bot data. So we have a lot of organizations today that process and see lots of traffic and they want to look at what's going on from a bot perspective, maybe look at trends from what's going on traffic-wise across different use cases. But you don't want to do this in the sim. We've now added the ability to do this custom reporting inside the web browser. So without having to send logs anywhere else, by leveraging single sign-on and role-based access 
you can do all of this deep dive and this deep analysis inside your own browser today. A new capability that we introduced with bot management is what we call our cloud proxy workers. And we developed this for bot protection, which allows us to understand and manipulate our proxy traffic without having to change core code inside of our proxy downstream. And this has opened up a series of new capabilities for us. And I'm gonna show you one that's about to be GA very, very soon in the next few months, which is around what we're doing for API data classification as well. On API security, we've made big investments around how we close out the top 10 of API security today. And for those that are unaware, on API security, we take a positive security model. You upload a schema to us, so let's say you use Swagger to define your APIs, or you use anything that leverages the open API specification. You take that schema, you upload that schema to us, and we've now built a positive model around it. And as traffic comes through, we'll do all the injection analysis, so we'll make sure that things like cross-site scripting or SQL injection are removed from those requests coming to your APIs, as well as we handle all the OWASP API top 10 that you see on the right, as well as we've added support for the open banking project. So for the organizations that are coming from financial services, those that are banks, you care about open banking. And we have native support for open banking now as part of our overall product. And we added in custom JSON and XML responses as well. I mentioned gRPC earlier. This is an important one for us too. Now, API data tracking is something that we have in preview today. And we believe that this is a big game changer around API security. Today, you get a lot of API traffic, but you don't necessarily know how much data is leaving or what kind of API data is leaving or what is being accessed. And we've built a unique series of capabilities that can see leveraging all sorts of data classification across a dozen different data domains. We can tell you exactly what data is being accessed and we can enrich your schemas. We can tell you which applications have sensitive data, which APIs have sensitive data, who's accessing that data and how much is leaving. And so an example, let's take a JSON response on the left-hand side. This is a simple data blob that has my user information. And on the right-hand side is our classification of being able to tell you that we found a user ID, that we found a mailing address, that it's related to PII. We do all of this automatically. And when you look at where we're going with API security, with learning and discovery, very soon you'll be able to onboard an API and we'll be able to tell you exactly where your APIs are, who's accessing them, and how much information is being exposed and how much data is being transferred over those APIs. I talked about attack analytics and actionable insights earlier. We've made very big investments here, specifically around turning it into more of a security hub. We have now tied in all of our sensors, so bot protection, API security, DDoS, RASP, and WAF. And we've now added in capabilities to do IP reputation. So the new workflow that we've added is, you can start at a high level, look at all of the trends that's going on, and now you can dive deep into a specific incident. And if you wanna look at exactly what's going on from that IP address, you can now click into that. We process 25 petabytes every single month of security traffic and we leverage reputation and threat intelligence from everything that we see all over the world. We've added a capability to do identification of weak configurations. So let's say you have a site configuration that allows for a thousand IPs to be whitelisted. If we see a bad IP address in threat intelligence, we'll, we'll let you know. And we'll also make a recommendation to build an exclusion of that IP address because maybe that IP address is a bad actor. And again, we leverage machine learning and we can do all of this automatically for you. So you can focus on your business knowing that we have you covered from a security perspective while giving you recommendations of what to do. We've also made very big investments in programmability, specifically around Terraform. We've added a, a Terraform provider that makes it extremely easy for you to get up and running with our Cloud Lab and frankly with all of our products. So if you want to be able to go ahead and create a new site with new rules and define users, you can do all of that programmatically all using Terraform. Our Terraform provider is open source. It's officially certified and supported today. And we've seen large organizations leveraging things like Terraform to deploy tens of thousands of sites with tens of thousands of rules today. We believe that this is an extremely easy way for people who are embracing DevOps inside their organization to have control over their Cloud WAF deployment in scale. 
I touched on DDoS a little bit earlier, but DDoS is an important thing for us. It's part of our single stack solution. So we've made further investments in ensuring that we have a three second SLA for DDoS mitigation. We created the industry's first SD knock so we can get to this three second SLA. And we've expanded our DDoS capabilities. Some of you may know us as DDoS for websites. Um, we've added support for DDoS for DNS. And just recently we added support for individual IPs. And like our other capabilities, it supports ingress, egress, TCP, UDP, as well as GRE and IP and IP. And we have two new DNS offerings that we're introducing as well this year, as well as automated security policy generation so we can make sure that we can protect organizations truly with that three second SLA. And again, that's a capability that we have that leverages the single stack solutions that we have today. Now I talk about the global network and one thing that I wanna highlight, and again, because it's very important in Spain, it's very important in EMEA to, to do things like network isolation. And we take this very seriously from a compliance and regulatory perspective. And so for us, there's two points that are extremely important in principles that we believe in. The first is clean traffic that's always going to be in country and in region. We always wanna make sure we do that. And then the second is we wanna make sure that we can do the DDoS mitigation closest to the attack outside of the country region. So that way we can make sure that your environment, that your networks are not overwhelmed and we can stop the attack before it even gets close to the data center that you are in. Now, one area that I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on and I'm gonna run you through a demo very quickly is what we do around RASP. RASP is a unique capability that's effectively an agent that lives inside of your application. And without making any source code changes that you'll see, you can now have application security travel everywhere your application goes. So think about it as a WAF that combines inside your application, but can see things that the WAF can't see. So it can have a deeper look at things like SQL injection. It has a deeper look at what's going on with command injection. Maybe you have a bad open source library or a bad dependency. We can see those and fix those without having a development team go back and make code changes at all. And I'll show you a demo of it in a moment. But where we're going with RASP, and we now have it in preview today, is we now have RASP working inside of serverless. So now if you were embracing or looking at things like AWS Lambda, we are gonna be a partner with AWS. It's in preview today, and if you are interested in looking at RASP plus Lambda, please let us know. Um, we'd love to help out, and we'd love to show you what we can do on that front. So with that, what I wanna do is I wanna jump over, um, if you, you can see my screen and it looks like you can, uh, looking at the preview over here. What I want to do is, is I want to take you through an example application of where we believe and how RASP works. So let me go in and let me start up an example application. This is an example application that we built inside of Java. And this Java application is connected to a MySQL database today. I'm going to jump back over to my web browser over here. I'm just going to refresh the page. So this is a dummy application that we built. Um, it's again, mentioned, as I mentioned, developed in Java, leveraging Angular JS in the front end. So it's a relatively modern application. And if I were to go and search for a stock like Google, I would get Google. And again, this is all fake data. Um, or if I were to search for something like Apple, I would get Apple's data over here. Now, if I'm an attacker, I might try something like a JavaScript attack, like a script alert one. And you'll see I was able to get cross-site scripting to execute in this case. And I don't have to tell you why cross-site scripting is bad, but I'm able to get cross-site scripting executed. Or I can go in and try something like a SQL injection, like an OR1 equals one, to pull stocks out of the underlying database. But it doesn't have to be as simple as an OR1 equals one, right? This is something that a WAF should be able to catch. The problem is you have attackers that are gonna get way more sophisticated around how they're gonna do things, how they're gonna extract data on the other side. They could try a technique, something like this, where they can try and leverage queries on the other end. Or they can go ahead and try and maybe run a more sophisticated union that they have on the other side. So multiple queries that they can stack to try and tease information out on the other side. A tautology doesn't have to be as simple as a one equals one. A tautology could be something that looks like this under the hood. So this understanding of knowing what's going on inside of the application is something that's been a big concern of organizations for the last 10 years. 
especially as they move more and more code to the cloud and as they move faster with microservices and RESTful APIs? How do you secure your applications from the inside out? And so with that, I'm gonna walk you now through a RASP install and you'll see something really interesting. That was it. There was no more work. And if I do a git diff, because again, I'm leveraging version control here, without making any source code changes, I'm simply attaching the agent to the application runtime. And I'm instructing the agent to start up with the configuration and you go to our management console to build a configuration and the configuration travels everywhere the agent does. So you now have an artifact that's moving together. You have an artifact that's your application, the Imperva Rasp agent, and you have a configuration file that's all going together. And of course, if we wanted to, we could also provide additional data. So if we wanted to say something like uh, country over here, we could say Spain. Or if we wanted to now supply additional information in here, maybe we have a Jenkins server and we can say build one, two, three. Again, any custom data that we want downstream. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go back up. I'm gonna rerun the application. So again, I made no source code changes whatsoever. And I wanna make sure that I've got security going everywhere my application goes. So we're starting the application server back up and you'll notice the application server is gonna bounce up exactly as it did before. We'll jump back to the web browser, we'll refresh, and then we'll make sure that the application is behaving as expected. So we'll do a search for Google and Google will come up. We'll do a search for Apple, Apple will come up. And now if the attacker were to try something like that JavaScript attack, that pop-up that you saw before is gone. That annoying pop-up box is gone. So we stopped cross-site scripting without having to make any source code changes. And if we go back and we look at something like a SQL injection, we were able to detect a tautology because we use a unique method called language security that actually understands what's happening inside of the application without running rules or signatures or definitions. And from a performance perspective, this is incredibly fast. Our customers see less than a 5% increase in memory less than a 5% increase in CPU, and less than a one millisecond latency, one millisecond latency across their normal applications. Companies that reuse and leverage RASP today, the Imperva RASP solution, are some of the biggest banks, some of the retail companies of the world that put this into production at scale. So from a, from a scalability perspective, from a performance perspective, this should be able to achieve the benchmarks that you're looking for, but where you don't have to compromise security as well as performance in your environment as well. So in this case, I was able to stop SQL injection and cross-site scripting. And as I mentioned before, we built integrations with various SIM providers. Here's a one-click integration that we built inside of our SIM. So this is an example of looking at something like Splunk, where you can now look at a detailed dashboard that pulls in all the metadata, all the information that you've seen from the local environment. And it's again, a one-click integration that you have over here. RASP is a really interesting thing because we can tell you everything that's going on inside of the application, including the various libraries, the various dependencies that you have inside of your environment. Sometimes with your applications, you're processing lots of information and maybe you're including libraries that are coming in from different resources and you wanna know what libraries are where. The benefit of being inside the application is we can now tell you where the application, all the jars, the versions of those jars, where they exist and again, RASP will go ahead and stop all of these attacks targeting these things without having to change any of the source code, which gives you back time and energy back in your back in your world. And another place what we think is really interesting is being able now to go back to your application development teams and show them exactly what they should be focusing on. So if we go back and we look at category SQL injection in this case, you'll see a live event that we're able to process and I'll increase my font size so you can see it. But we blocked an attack for SQL injection. And again, it's uh, 8.30 a.m. over here for me. And we'll automatically pull out information like Java, the version of Java, the metadata, and you'll see the country that we added, Spain, the Jenkins build, build one, two, three, that we just added dynamically, all the HTTP information that we have downstream. If you leverage our WAF, and you'll see why the combination of WAF and RAS makes sense in a little bit, you'll see the headers downstream as well. And you'll go all the way down and Two unique things to call out here is with RASP, we see who's logged into the application by looking at the runtime session. 
So without looking at an IP address, we can tell you that this is the user, these are their entitlements, all from using the application inside, which we know is extremely important from an audit perspective and regulatory compliance perspective, as well as being able to tell you exactly what we saw inside the application. So we see this executing in a file called basestock.java on line 60. So now if you wanted to go back to your development teams and tell them that you have something that you need to fix regarding SQL injection in your source code, you can tell them, go back to your application, load up this file basestock.java, and jump to line 60. There you go. That's where the SQL injection is happening. So now you can go back in and you can tell your application teams, look, there is a security attack that's targeting this specific part of your file. We are leveraging RASP, so we're safe, but we recommend that you prioritize and you fix this. So the idea of RASP is you get security on your terms that goes wherever your application goes, you deploy faster to production, and at the same time, you give more time for your teams to go and fix things. So you have the ability to deploy while not slowing the deployment down of the overall company. Again, we'll have more information that we can share later on if you'd like around RASP and how RAS can be helpful for your environment as well. So I'm going to go back over to my presentation. Let me just click the big button here. All right, very good. So as I mentioned before, RASP is now going to be targeting functions as a service. So you'll see it going at Lambda. You'll see it going after GCP functions, Azure functions as well. So the other area that I wanted to focus on regarding innovation is our unified management console. Because we have those breadth of sensors around what we do in Edge and application and data, we've combined all of those together into a single interface where you can now manage everything from a single pane of glass. And one area that we've heard a lot from our customers is wanting to get Imperva on the go, wanting to see everything that's happening in one place and being able to access that from your phone, not just a mobile, uh, view of the dashboard, but something that would be a mobile application. And so we released an iOS application that's iPhone and iPad compatible. Android support is coming this year, but we have the ability now to give you a mobile application where you can look at a security overview. You can see what exactly is going on that leverages attack analytics. You have full visibility into bot. It combines all of the sensors and all of the analytics from all of our sensors into one place today. And we seen our customers get a lot of value of being able to take security on the go, being able to take insights on the go and see everything on, on their terms wherever they want it. Now I talked a little bit before around this concept of defense in depth when you saw the RASP demo. How does RASP and WAF work together? Well, we believe they work together because if you can see something inside of the application, you can now go back to attack analytics, which is this hub, and you can now have attack analytics go and build a rule automatically inside the WAF. So tomorrow, if you have a future attack that's targeting the application, maybe it's deserialization, or maybe it's something serious targeting an open source library or a very specific SQL injection, RASP can stop it and now can go back and build a rule automatically at the WAF. So the WAF can now go and automatically put that in place so that will never come back into your network, will never come back into your application. So it's this concept of defense in depth that we see today. And we believe this is extremely important. And so RASP and WAF, we, all of those integrate into attack analytics. And rule orchestration today is something that we provide recommendations for. At the end of the year, that rule orchestration will be completely automatic for organizations that want that automatic capability of being able to leverage one to make the other one stronger and better. Now, I talked about insights. I've talked about attack analytics. Where people get value out of actionable insights is being able to see everything, not just from here's every single event that's going on, but seeing everything in terms of trends, putting it into a narrative. And what our customers get value out of when they leverage our insights capabilities is they don't have to look at the billions of events every single day. They reduce those events into a simple number of incidents, into a simple number of actionable insights that tells you exactly who, what, when, and where. And what we found is, and again, this is data from a very large financial services customer of ours in Asia, they were able to reduce and focus the amount of time from just two people working full time inside their SOC that are looking for actionable insights every single day. They're able to reduce 
the number of incidents. So instead of looking at 10,000 alerts every single day inside the SIM, it's 12 actionable insights. They investigate 100% of everything, and they're leveraging the trends to now do deeper dives in the analysis. Ultimately, it's to reduce all the risky blind spots that we know that organizations have today. Now, one of the blind spots that we know organizations have is specifically around data. And today, when you have someone that's accessing data directly, whether it's a DBA or a data analyst, you have insight as to who they are. You know the IP address where they're coming from. But if you have someone that's going through an application that's accessing data, you don't necessarily know who they are. Inside of data logs, all you have today from a data regulatory risk compliance perspective is just the fact that it's a service account. You don't know that it's a regular human being and the human that's using a specific application that's making a data call. All you have is a service account. So it's a big blind spot that we see today. Organizations don't have a complete audit trail. They don't have complete visibility and they can't understand what is anomalous, what is truly something that is irregular inside of their environment. Well, leveraging RASP, what you saw earlier, plus WAF and DAM downstream, we, we have a unique capability that we call user to data tracking. We can tell you if it's a human or a bot, if they're coming from a good network or a bad network, if they're using a web browser or a mobile application, who they're logged in as inside the application, what they're doing, how many records are they accessing, is that information sensitive? Is a PCI regulated? Then we can tell you if it's normal. Is it normal for this user Joe to be accessing 10 million records when they only access a few records? And today we can do all of this and we do all of this out of the box. And when I say out of the box, everything is seamlessly integrated. And I'm gonna show you this in a demonstration right now. So this is an example application, a different application that we develop, and it's publicly available to the internet. We have our cloud WAF in front, we have RASP installed, and we have data activity monitoring as well. And database activity monitoring, for those that are unaware, it's like an agent that we built for applications that plugs into your database. We have a similar approach for cloud databases. It's called cloud data security. It's not an agent, but it pulls that audit that's being enriched from the databases back into the SIM or back into an analysis engine as well. I'm gonna log into my application over here. And this is a dummy application that we built. It allows you to go in and do things like transfers. It's just a simple banking application. So I'm gonna, let's say, do a transfer from one account to another, and let's say I'm gonna move uh, 10,000. I'm gonna go ahead and make a transfer. The transfer was created, and we're done. Okay, so we've now gone in and we've done a transfer inside of this application. Now today, organizations, when it comes to performing things like risk analysis or uh, audit analysis, a lot of organizations today have to take a lot of logs from a lot of different places and glue them all together to understand exactly what's going on. Well, we made that really simple, and we made it even simpler to understand exactly who's accessing what, where it's coming from, and what's going. So we call it uh, Imperva One User Data Tracking. But the idea is you can now go in and see who logged into the application, so the application users, where they logged in from, the request URLs that they use, so this is leveraging our, our Cloud WAF capability, the data that they went up against through those applications, the operations they made, the client types that they used, and all the individual database queries. So it's really compressing everything from the edge, applications and data, and putting it truly into one place. And so now if you wanted to run an investigation on a specific user, you could. Maybe you wanna see everything that my user account did inside the application. So you can now go in, you can see my access, you can see all the different databases that I went up against, the client types that I used as well. And where it gets interesting is wanting to fold the rest of the stack together. So if you now wanna do an investigation to see, well, what's the risk of a specific database? You can now go in, and it's gonna take a second for it to load up in this environment. But now if I wanna go back, and let's say I switch the timetable to, instead of relative three seconds ago, let's say 15 weeks ago, I can now look back and see potential security scans that went up against this database. So if there were vulnerabilities, if there were any misconfigurations regarding uh, this database that was being accessed from the front end that this user was accessing, you now have access to that, as well as it's bringing in access control issues. Again, all into one page. It's part of that idea of now folding the world together. And of course, you may wanna know about what was actually in there. It says classified data exists in the database. So now we have a user that's making a call to this transactions table or an accounts table, 
what's actually in that environment? And again, my, I ran a scan a while ago, so let me just go back in and run this back a while ago. So let's say uh, arbitrary time. I'll now be able to go back in over here and I can see all the different data types that are present. And again, I'm folding various pieces of the world that have just never been put together before to now try and answer bigger questions around who access data, where do they come from, where are they going, is that data sensitive, and should I be worried about how much data was actually touched or accessed on the other side? So we believe that this combination of our capabilities can solve a really interesting set of use cases. Now, I'll close by saying that many organizations know Imperva as being the best in either application security or data security. And we have leadership positions across the board in all these different areas. But what you're starting to see is us connecting all these capabilities together so we can give you better tools to solve bigger problems that you have. This idea of being best of platform is where we're driving things. And really to think about Imperva in the context of how we work versus the competition, you have folks out there that may specialize maybe in edge or maybe in one dimension of application security or maybe just in data security. We believe that we're best of breed in all of these areas. We've been a multi-year leader in edge security four years now. We've been a six-time leader in the Gartner Magic Quadrant for WAF, a two-time leader in the Forrester Wave for BOT. We're the only market leader in RASP. And we have leadership positions, depending on the analysts you're going to, on the data security. And we know we're the only one doing things on the actionable insight side. Doing business with Imperva means not just that you're consolidating with us, but you're going to be able to leverage all of your capabilities on all of our capabilities to solve the biggest problems that you have in your environment today. And of course, we integrate broadly in the, the overall ecosystem. I won't call all of them out individually, but I'll say that we work with SOAR providers, SIM providers, we care about DevOps, we, clear, we care about cloud security and cloud service providers, notification systems as well, data stores, data providers. I want to give you a sense of the fact that we're not an island and we're working with all of the different broader organizations that exist out there as well. And so we covered a lot of content today. We, we walked through uh, the problem statement, what Imperva does at a high level. We did a RASP demo. We did a user to data tracking demo. We highlighted all the innovation that we've done with respect to application security, as well as touching on the partnerships that we have in place. And so I've been talking for about 40, 45 minutes now. Um, and I would love to answer any questions uh, that anyone may have today. And I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kunal. Great presentation. Yes, we have uh, we have several several questions in in the panel. Uh, the first the first question is um, about um, application security. In terms of uh, you presented three different choices for securing applications: cloud WAF, uh, on-prem WAF and RASP, are these solutions exclusive among themselves or are they complementary solutions? Uh, in a scenario where no WAF is deployed, uh, what would be your recommendation? Yeah, so let me go back. It's a great question. Let me go back to um, the diagram over here where we talk about the, the paths to data that exists. So here's what we've holistically understood. And here's what we see a lot of our customers doing. If you are deploying more workloads to the cloud and you want better security for those cloud applications and those cloud services, we believe CloudWAF is a really good fit. It's a capability that you don't have to manage. We manage all of that for you. We have a threat research team that'll go ahead and do all of that management on your behalf. So if a new attack happens, we'll make sure that we introduce all of that, a block or a signature, capabilities like that. WAF Gateway makes a lot of sense if you want to make sure that you can manage the WAF on your terms. Maybe you want to be able to manage the WAF in an on-premise environment. Maybe your organization uh, wants a more hardware-oriented approach. WAF Gateway makes a lot of sense in that world. RASP makes a lot of sense if you have newer kinds of applications or even legacy applications where you can't go back and fix the software vulnerabilities. And so we believe that all three of these things can work together. We typically see organizations that leverage WAF and RASP together. We see organizations that have a blend of cloud WAF for more of their modern applications or applications that 
are exposed to the public internet where they are maybe hammered by things like bots. With WAF Gateway, we typically see that used not just for workloads internally, but also things like east-west traffic. RASP as well is another one that we see in conjunction of all of them. So it really depends on the use case. Um, we see a, typically a combination of WAF and RASP though. Okay, thank you, Gnall. Uh, another question is uh, about DDoS. Um, it says that I already have uh, a DDoS provided by my carrier. Uh, why should I consider Imperva? So on the DDoS side, one of the areas that we focus a lot on is performance, specifically the three-second SLA. Um, we have 44 points of presence all over the world, and I'll, I'll skip to this slide on the uh, the global network now. We have we have 44 points of presence all over the world, and what makes us unique is that every single one of our POPs is a scrubbing center, which is extremely different from anyone else. We are also one of the few that will do the network isolation of clean traffic inside the country and region, as well as DDoS mitigation. So we're not only gonna make sure that we've got the best technology deployed, but we're also gonna adhere to regulatory requirements and compliance as well. We've added, as I mentioned before, DDoS capabilities, not just for websites, DNS, IP addresses, and again, there's other capabilities on the DDoS side that we continue to add more into. What makes us different is the technology, the software-defined NOC capability that we have, the automatic and automated uh, security policy generation, ASPG, that we're adding in as well. Um, DNS, as I mentioned before, we have two DNS offerings on the DDoS side or on the edge side that we're introducing later this year as well. Makes us very different than um, a provider or a cloud service provider that is going to say that they solve DDoS. Ultimately, you want to get that far, far away from your cloud service provider because ultimately it's just going to increase the bill uh, for your cloud service provider, specifically if you are using things like AWS Elastic Load Balancing where that traffic is still going to have to get held by an ELB before it gets rejected. Okay. Another question is, is about data security. It says, how are you seeing the data security landscape after GDPR was launched? Yeah, so on the data security side, what we've typically seen, and I'll skip back to this uh, this slide over here, is we've now seen, especially over the last few months, more organizations moving more of their data to the cloud faster than before. And with that, organizations looking for ways to secure cloud data. And that's why we pushed out cloud data security, specifically because we realize that organizations need compliance around data that they're moving to the cloud. A lot of organizations don't have an understanding of where their data is in the cloud, what's in those databases in the cloud, and how that, that's all being accessed. Typically, with databases in the cloud, you know that you have an instance, and you know that you've got users that are permissioned for it. You don't necessarily know what's in it. You don't know the risk associated or the privileged user access that you have on the other side. So we've seen a big push from organizations that are wanting cloud security just because of the most recent changes around acceleration with COVID and COVID-19. Okay. Uh, this one is about uh, bot protection. Uh, you mentioned you acquire these steel networks. Uh, what are the verticals are more relevant for advanced bot protection among your customer base? So bot protection is an interesting one. Um, and in the bad bot report, we, we call it out. Um, really, all verticals are being affected by it. I would say the ones that are more affected by it these days have been around regulated industries, so things around finance, banking. I would say retail is affected heavily by this as well. Uh, travel, transportation, um, these all, all of these industries are being affected by what's going on. We've seen a surge and in increase of, of spam. We've seen a surge of bot traffic that has started to do things like interference and things like elections. So we have a US election coming up as an example. Uh, we're seeing a heavy increase of bot activity as we get closer and closer to the election. So we're seeing bot use cases everywhere, uh, mostly around things like credential stuffing. We're seeing scraping come up as well. We're also seeing transactional fraud, so things like gift card fraud or just general card, card fraud. So things like authentication, authorization, and transactional fraud. Um, so industries that are having to fight those on a daily basis, they're fighting those heavily right now and they're leveraging bot for that. Okay. Uh, another question is, in my organization, uh, we rely pretty much for application security in our uh, secure, and secure development life cycle. Um, uh, we use tools like SAST and DAST. Uh, how can Rust help me? 
Great question. So today, for those that are leveraging things like SAST and DAST, they're doing a good job of telling you that you have vulnerabilities inside your application, but they're not fixing those. You as an organization have to go through the effort of qualifying, understanding that that's an issue, and then fixing them. It takes hundreds of days for organizations to fix one critical issue. And this is a report that was published by Veracode, one of our sister companies. And they told us that it takes hundreds of days to fix a single high level issue like a SQL injection because the amount of time it takes to qualify a false positive, the amount of time it takes to go back to a development team to go and fix the issue. So what we've understood is when organizations deploy RASP, they can do two things. One, they can speed up the process of deploying to production so they don't need to wait for everything to be fixed in SAST and DAS to deploy. The second is they can now go back to the app dev team and say, we've given you a backlog from SAS and DAS that has 100 vulnerabilities. We're now going to tell you out of those 100, here are the two or three that are highly critical that you must focus on. So really allowing people to get higher focus and prioritization around what needs to truly be done from a SAS and DAS perspective, making teams more efficient. Okay. Uh, last question I see in, in the panel. Um, the dashboards and parsing of Imperva products, SecureSphere, CloudWav, et cetera, are those available somewhere? Uh, I'm talking about Elastic, he says. Yes, all of that is available. Um, so all of that is available. You can get access to all of that through Imperva, through, through us. Uh, you can also go through the various marketplaces because, again, we work through lots of different sims. And if anyone is looking to see where we're going on the sim side, uh, we'd be happy to set up more time and again if you've got specific use cases on the sim side i, I don't know who answered who asked the question but if someone has deeper questions around where we're going from a sim perspective we'd be happy to share that as well because ultimately we believe that your data is your data and you want to be able to look at your data anywhere whether that's in our environment or any sim that you have downstream and we think the dashboards that we have will make it a lot easier to get up and running and so without having to spend time and energy to build dashboards and reports leverage what we have today so you can see all of that on your terms okay uh, thank you very much kunal we do not have any any more questions in, in in the panel thank you thank you very much for your help and your collaboration to organize this in this uh, session now i'm going to give the turn to uh, danny de la camera danny are you with us daniel estás estás en la sesión Sí, uh, no te oímos, Daniel. Eh, Dani, ¿estás, estás, en, ¿estás en mute? Ya está, creo que sí. Creo que Ahora, ya... perfecto, Dani, perfecto. ¡Vamos! ¡Vamos! <risa> ¡Qué alegría, Jesús, estar aquí con vosotros! Lo primero, déjame felicitarte. De, eh, primero a todos los que estáis ahí. Pero, joder, ¿sabéis inglés? Jesús. Te he visto hablar inglés muy bien, fluido. He alucinado. Y encima, Mira, encima está... me pagan por ello, Dani. Joder, es que aquí es que haces cosas increíbles. Te he visto preguntar, además, fíjate, a la gente hacer preguntas con mucho sentido. Porque en este país, si algo nos gusta, es hacer preguntas que sabemos la respuesta. ¿No? Por ejemplo, tú te caes en la calle y ¿qué te pregunta la gente? ¿Te has caído? O sea, nos gusta preguntar cosas que sabemos. O sales de la peluquería, te encuentras un amigo, ese amigo siempre te preguntará lo mismo. Tío, ¿te has cortado el pelo? Que hagan de decirle, no, me lo he metido por dentro, ¿sabes? O sea, son cosas, preguntamos ese tipo de cosas, pero alucina con el inglés, Jesús, porque no es por hacerte la pelota. Pero mira, en este país, los que estáis viendo este webinar, enhorabuena, sois de los pocos que sabéis inglés. Porque en este país solo hay un momento en que sabemos inglés. Yo creo que solo hay uno. Cuando vamos a una entrevista de trabajo. Solo ahí. Como dicen, seguro que a ti te pasó, Jesús, que te dijeron, nivel de inglés, y, y, medio alto. En tu caso era verdad, incluso alto. O sea, muy bien. Eh, y que todo queda más chulo. Yo estaba viendo todos los nombres que utilizan en inglés. Proxy, security, data tracking. Queda mejor. Todo queda mejor en inglés. Eh, la música eso, fíjate, lo saben. Justin Bieber. Eso suena a éxito. Fíjate aquí cómo sería. Justino Vela. Ya, ya suena Fontanero 24 horas, ¿sabes? No, no, 
o, yo, yo qué sé, la canción, seguro que os acordáis de esta canción. Opa, voy a hacer un corral. Una, una porquería. Pero en inglés, oh yeah, I wanna make a band. Ya es otra cosa. Ya es otra cosa. Michael Jackson, fíjate, un genio, ¿eh? Pero le ayuda al inglés. Tú fíjate, el grito de Michael Jackson en inglés. ¡Au! Fíjate aquí cómo sería. ¡Yepa! Es otra cosa, es otra cosa. Bueno, eh, estoy muy contento de estar aquí. He intentado seguir lo que he podido. Mi inglés... Me hubiera costado en español también, escuché tanto dato de ese. También os lo digo. Pero si en algún sitio hace falta seguridad, es en este país. Porque no vemos el riesgo. Entonces está muy bien que nos digan, que ha apuntado aquí el dato, que hay 18 billones de ataques. Esto porque el español, nosotros no vemos el peligro. Somos el único país, no sé si sabéis este dato, seguro que lo habéis leído, que no termina de funcionar el carnet por puntos de conducir. Nos dan igual los puntos. Si nos importaran los puntos, no mandaríamos a Radio Eurovisión. Es, es lo que creo que debe pasar. El paquete de tabaco. ¿Habéis visto? Se fuma más ahora que antes de que pusieran fumar mata. La gente aquí coge el cigarro y dice, será otro. ¿Sabes? No, no, no te preocupa. Yo voy a dar, a ver, no voy a llegar al nivel de cunal, pero voy a dar consejos si alguien me está oyendo de, de tabaco, creo que hay mensajes que asustan más que la muerte, que deberían ponerlo. En vez de fumar mata, poner, yo qué sé, fumar, te quita la wifi. A ver si hay huevos, ahora fumar. Fumar, consume datos. ¡Oh! Oh, para la gente joven, ¿vale? Para que no fume. Paquirín, fumaba mucho de pequeño y mira, joder, eso ya el tabaco a tomar por saco. Pero es verdad que hace falta mucho la seguridad en este país. Os voy a dar un dato, ¿vale? Somos el único país, fijaros si no vemos el peligro, por eso es tan importante este webinar, que sé que correr delante de un toro se corre. Aunque sea a las 8 de la mañana, mamao, y sin dormir, pues se corre. Y con un pañuelo rojo en el cuello para que no se despiste el pobre toro. Este año no hay San Fermín, pero por favor, intentad recordarlo. O la próxima vez que lo veáis, eh, siempre, siempre es así, ¿vale? ¿Veis al toro que va corriendo? Ve a 10.000 ahí con el pelo moreno, el tío a lo suyo, pero es levantar la vista y ver unos rubitos, mira, le entran unos espasmos, ya iba a por el Johansson, el que estaba de Erasmus, aquí, es el que se lleva el propio gordo del día. Por eso te digo, no vemos el peligro y vosotros os dedicáis a la seguridad y eso está muy bien, aquí la necesitamos. Yo no os quiero hacer la pelota, Jesús, no, no lo quiero hacer, ¿vale? Pero lo de la seguridad es muy importante. Yo me dedico a hacer eventos de empresa y he asistido, me han contratado, ¿vale? En algunos que dices, ¿de verdad esto vendéis? Productos peligrosos. Quiero decir que si os sintáis orgullosos, vosotros vendéis seguridad. Hay gente que vende productos peligrosos. No voy a decir marcas, pero yo qué sé, Gillette, por ejemplo. Estuve con ellos. ¿Sabéis que hay una maquinilla afeitar de cinco cuchillas? Esto lo sabéis, ¿no? Jesús, anda así con la cabeza, yo a ti te veo. Eso ya estaba. Entonces, el de I más D, de Gillette, muy sádico, debió decir, vamos a darle vidilla a ese material y le ha puesto pilas. ¡Pilas! O sea, no bastaba que con cinco cuchillas, que no hace falta ser un H en matemáticas para saber que un despiste son cinco cortes, sino que es que encima ahora tiene pilas. Que te estás afeitando medio dormido ahí por la noche y está la yugular. Déjate barba, déjate barba. Me la regalaron, bueno, le he puesto en la cocina, ¿sabes? Para cortar jamón, ¿sabes? Que hacer así y te salen cinco luchas finas. Digo, pues, pues será para eso. Entonces, sentiros orgullosos. Os voy a decir otros que, me, que son peligrosos, ¿vale? Eh, yo soy fan, de esta marca soy fan, pero los muebles de Ikea. Soy fan. Pero qué peligroso. La gente que esté casada, Jesús, eh, ¿estás casado? Hazme así con la cabeza. Los que estéis casados, que me estéis viendo, cuidado con los muebles de Ikea, porque ¿cuántas parejas se han separado en ese parking? Ir un sábado por la tarde, que es cuando las parejas deciden ir a Ikea, supongo que el plan será, pues nos vamos el sábado por la tarde, nos saltamos la siesta y así no pillamos a nadie. Que dices, qué bien pensado, muy bien pensado. Estáis para dirigir el G20 vosotros dos solos. Bueno, el caso, mirarlo. Cuando vayáis, sábado 5 de la tarde, la imagen siempre es la misma. El marido intentando meter un portaaviones de madera en un Seat Ibiza 
Y la mujer a un metro detrás ayudando. Te lo dije que no cabía. Te lo dije que no cabía. Y tú que tengo un metro en la cabeza, pero estás imbécil, ¿sabes? Y ahí empieza el divorcio. Por cierto, ¿quién pone los nombres del Ikea? Porque habéis visto que están en nombres raros. A Steve Hodgins, a Hitch, Dicen que es sueco. O sea, se nos da mal el inglés. A vosotros no, pero se nos da mal el inglés. Imagínate el sueco antiguo. Yo creo que esos nombres se los inventan. Para ponerlos, atragantan a un tío con un filete y cuando está el tío ahí, hay un tío por detrás. Aguanta que nos quedan tres muebles, lo estás bordando. Este, este es muy bueno. Entonces, sentiros orgullosos. Vendéis seguridad. Y te voy a decir una cosa, Jesús, muy personal. Y tampoco es por haceros la pelota. Y os voy a decir por qué. La seguridad, habéis puesto, he visto en la presentación, que es la joya de la corona. Ahora, en inglés, creo que he deducido que era eso, la joya de la corona. Es lo más grande. La seguridad es lo más grande. Y os lo voy a demostrar. Yo estuve actuando, esto es una cosa muy personal, pero estamos en un webinar entre nosotros. Yo estuve actuando hasta el 12 de marzo, hice mi última actuación. Actué el 7 para 400 personas, el 5 para también 200 y pico. Y no había problema con el coronavirus. Nos abrazábamos, el día 5 nos dábamos abrazos, chocábamos las manos, no pasaba nada. Total, que me cogí un coronavirus tremendo. Está un mes malo. Este es un mes malo. ¿Por qué digo que la seguridad es tan importante? Porque lo he pasado muy mal, he estado un mes muy malo. Se lo pegué a mi mujer, que ya esto es para siempre. Porque mi mujer ahora cuando quiere cualquier cosa me dice, venga, que me pegaste el coronavirus, me pegaste el coronavirus. Estoy en deuda de por vida ya, ¿vale? Pero os voy a decir por qué es lo más grande. Porque me he hecho unos análisis que te miden los anticuerpos. A partir de 1,24 eres inmune. Yo tengo 8,6. Soy un superhéroe ahora mismo. Nunca me he sentido un superhéroe, pero ahora salgo a la calle con una seguridad. Por eso os lo digo. Salgo con una seguridad. En mi casa yo veo que sale gente y para coger las puer la puerta del portal se ponen guantes, cogen un clines. Mira, yo me planteo y digo, dejarme a mí, dejarme a mí. Y sin guantes. Yo veo que me mira la gente como si fuera un superhéroe. Como digo, ¡guau! salgo con una seguridad. Por eso sé que todo lo que habéis contado es muy importante estar seguro. Os voy a poner un ejemplo. Esto es que parece que es un chiste, pero es totalmente cierto. Voy por la calle, ¿vale? Y veo a 30 metros o así que se me acerca uno en dirección contraria, sin mascarilla, y empieza a hacer algo que ahora es un terror. Empieza a toser. A hacer... <coughs> Ni me crucé. Veía a los de al lado que se tiraban como si fueran como si fueran soldados, como si hubiera estallado una granada. Y yo me daban ganas de darle un abrazo. Ven aquí, venga, contágiate un poco de mí que tengo anticuerpos, ¿sabes? Ningún problema. He sentido lo increíble que es la seguridad. Entonces, eh, enhorabuena porque os dedicáis a una cosa muy importante. Ahora me gustaría, eh, me quedan pocos minutos, eh, seguramente os estaréis preguntando. Yo no os puedo dar la seguridad si vamos a salir de esto o no. Lo que os digo. Ayuda mucho el humor, de verdad. Tomaros un poquito eh, con humor las cosas. Os voy a decir un ejemplo, ¿vale? Eh, las noticias ahora son muy malas. Eran malas antes, imagínate ahora. El otro día el Dalai Lama, no sé si conocéis al Dalai Lama. Jesús, ¿conocéis al Dalai Lama? El, el, hermano, de, el hermano de Manolo Lama. Es un tío muy, muy tranquilo, ¿vale? Estaba viendo un telediario el otro día nuestro, lo tuvieron que sedar. Era el telediario de Pedro Piqueras, ¿vale? que es más fuerte que la media, no sé si conocéis el telediario de Piqueras, es el que dirige Tarantino por la cena en Telecinco. Es este que gira la cabeza. No sé si lo habéis visto, que antes de empezar, os lo voy a hacer, ¿eh? para todos vosotros, os lo voy a hacer. Este empieza y hace así, mirad. Y dices, joder, empezamos bien, Peter, macho. Yo voy al hospital, ¿qué tal están mis análisis? Y te hace así el doctor y digo, ampute, haga lo que tenga que hacer, pero cúreme ya, ¿sabes? Bueno, entonces, poneros los telediarios mexicanos. Pues son tan alegres hablando. Ahora nos hace falta mucha alegría. Os lo digo totalmente en serio. Hace falta juntaros con gente que tenga alegría. No sé quién ha contratado humor, pero muy bien, Jesús, el que se le haya ocurrido. Muy bien, porque lo necesitamos. Por ejemplo, en vez de ver a Piqueras, ponte el telediario mexicano. Si ves que va mal. Porque son tan alegres hablando que aunque den malas noticias, te animan. Os lo voy a hacer, ¿eh? Pelerio mexicano. Solo un tío sano con bigote ahí. Buenas tardes, bienvenidos al noticiario de las 12. Es otro rollo. 
Enseguida nos vamos a Chapas, el debido accidente. Pero antes nos gustaría saludar a las revijas en el Día de su Santo. Felicitación, felicitación, feliz. Porque siempre acaban cantando. Pues fijaros, funciona. Y en esos días que estábamos, o sea, os acordáis con la prima de riesgo. Porque ahora la prima de riesgo está bien. Dicen, ¡buah! Oh, va a venir ahora. Pero la prima de riesgo está muy bien. Y antes llegó a estar a 600 y pico. Yo en esos días decía, era tan difícil cuando vienen noticias malas, cuando estaba la prima de riesgo a 600 y pico, que parecía que se que subía al país. Poner tertulianos mexicanos en todos los programas de televisión y de radio. No es lo mismo levantarse con una agonía, estamos al borde del rescate. Que un tío, ándale, vamos con ese rescatito. Y es otra cosa. Necesitamos de verdad tomar un poco de distancia, ver las cosas con humor. Hemos visto cosas increíbles. ¿Quién nos iba a decir que el papel higiénico iba a ser el tope de prestigio en el supermercado por encima de la langosta? O sea, el, ha vivido su momento de gloria. Encontró una mascarilla. Es que ha sido imposible. Hemos vivido cosas. Encontró una mascarilla. Ha habido, fíjate, ha habido momentos que era más fácil encontrar a un concursante de hombres, mujeres y viceversa, con estudios que una mascarilla. Ha sido acojonante lo que, lo que hemos vivido. Hemos visto. Yo aquí hubiera perdido dinero, hubiera apostado en contra, pero me he dado cuenta que somos puntuales. Hemos sido puntuales durante más de dos meses, a las 8, no a las 8, a las 7 y 58, dando aplausos todo el mundo con una puntualidad ale más que alemana. Joder, eso somos nosotros. Hemos visto cosas increíbles. Y si me preguntáis, ¿qué es lo único que os puedo decir? ¿Qué seguridad tienes que vamos a salir de esto? Os voy a decir una cosa muy rápido. Por supuesto que vamos a salir. Y aquí vamos a liderar los que, vosotros que estáis en el mundo de la informática, vamos a liderar, Jesús, los de nuestra generación. La gente que no somos nativos digitales. Los que somos de 25 para arriba. Porque estamos entrenados en el dolor, en el sufrimiento. Somos gente que si hemos salido, es, que estamos vivos de milagro. Que somos gente que ya hemos vivido, que nos hemos criado jugando en la calle. ¿No? Nosotros. Que hay gente que puede decir, ¡ay, qué romántico! Criarse en la calle. ¿Qué dices? Vamos a ver. Romántico es echar un kick en la Torre Eiffel. Eso es romántico. No es jugar al fútbol, como es jugar nosotros al fútbol, a cero grados y en camiseta. Porque los abrigos eran para hacer la portería. Acordaros. No había forro polar, no había coretes. El señor quechua no había nacido. Somos muy fuertes. Hemos superado, los que tengáis más de 30, os voy a decir una cosa que os vais a ver que hemos superado cosas muy fuertes. El burro. Ahora hemos jugado al burro. Jesús, antes así has jugado al burro, ¿no? Seguro que todos vosotros habéis jugado al burro. Los que tengáis más de 30, seguro. Ahora no se juega. Está prohibido por el tribunal de la Haya jugar al burro. Pero nosotros lo tenemos grabado en nuestras cervicales. Churro, media manga y manga entera. Somos así de fuertes. En urgencias lo llamaban lumbalgia, ciática y suerte las paralimpiadas. Fíjate la diferencia. Somos gente... ¿Habéis visto? Por eso os digo que vamos a salir de lo que sea. ¿Habéis visto cómo juegan los niños a la guerra ahora? Que juegan con la PlayStation, el Call of Duty. ¿Qué te va a pasar? Mamá, me ha dado un tironcito en el pulgar. Es el mayor contratiempo. Acordaros de esto, de lo fuertes que somos. Nosotros jugamos a la guerra con palos y piedras, de verdad. ¿Y quién ganaba esa guerra? Pues el que menos sangraba, es el que ganaba. Ahora fijaros lo que ha cambiado esto. Un niño coge el mando de la PlayStation, da un circulito y es Messi. Nosotros, para ser Maradona, tenemos que darle una rayita. Es más peligroso, ¿sabes? Es otro peligro. Yo pillé el inicio de los videojuegos, supongo que tú también, Jesús, la Spectrum. ¿Os acordáis de la Spectrum? Esa que algunos me están haciendo ahora como Jesús, como ¡jo! ¡Oh! La Spectrum, fijaros, los que si no la conocéis sois más jóvenes que yo, era una que para jugar el sábado la tenías que encender el martes. Nuestros marcianos eran gente buena, se dejaban andar, solo hacían así, ¿eh? por si alguno no lo ha visto, o lo hago. Pero esto no es lo que hacían nuestros marcianos, solo se movían así, solo hacían eso. Por eso os digo que somos gente muy fuerte. Hemos superado un montón de cosas. Somos muy duros, porque ahora los niños están, por supuesto, y muy bien, súper protegidos. Los que tenéis hijos, que ha sido 
el coronavirus con hijos, eso eh, ha sido otro, el confinamiento con hijos, <risa> esto ha sido tremendo. Que no lo tengáis, si, si nos vuelven a encerrar, si no tenéis hijos pequeños, de verdad, aunque seáis ateos, rezar mucho, dar las gracias a Dios. Porque, o sea, es una cosa, o sea, con niños, ha sido, porque ahora hay que protegerlos, a los niños ahora no se pueden aburrir. Uy, si se aburre un niño, claro, estallaría, ¿sabes? Ahora, no sé lo que pasaría. Y, y por eso los padres, ahora no basta con ser padre o madre, hay que ser amigo, confidente, animador, coach, psicólogo, profe particular, chofer, mayordomo, hay que ser hasta cocinero profesional, porque los niños han visto Masterchef Junior en la tele y ya el tomate Orlando se les queda corto. Todo hay que hacérselo, las lentejas se las hacemos en puré, no era como nosotros, ¿os acordáis que os decían? Lentejas, si quieres las comes y si no las dejas, y las podías dejar, pero para la merienda o para la noche, eso, era, eso te la tenías que comer. El pescado, ahora los niños se las toman sin espinas, ¿os acordáis nosotros? Que decían, mamá tiene espinas, ¿y qué decían nuestras madres? ¿Qué nos decían? Pues las quitas, comer pescado cuando éramos pequeños. ¡Oh! Mira, te rezabas como, como, como en la final de la Champions, te concentrabas porque sabías cuántos hermanos empezabas a cenar, pero no cuántos acababan. Era una cosa increíble. Por eso te digo, ahí se ve que hemos superado y que somos duros por las cosas que nos dieron de pequeños y que hemos superado. Yo no sé si os acordáis, Jesús, fijaros lo duros que somos, ¿eh? lo preparados que estamos, nuestro sistema inmune tiene que estar fuerte. Fijaros lo que hemos comido, que los niños pequeños ahora no comen. El fogras la piara. ¿Os acordáis del fogras la piara? Sí que te preparabas una rebanada y tu perro ladraba. ¡Guau! 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 Se creía que te estabas comiendo su comida. ¿Os acordáis? ¿Qué, qué? Hemos comido, yo qué sé, el, el, por ejemplo, el, el turrón de coco. Todos hemos comido turrón de coco. Que ahora hay muchas variantes. Pero si habéis comido turrón de coco, que sepáis que estaba caducado. Porque el turrón de coco no se compra. Se hereda. Hemos, de verdad, hemos superado la casquería, por ejemplo. Porque ahora los niños no toman casquería. Pero nosotros, yo me acuerdo que tu madre decía, a comer. Y veías un filete raro, como del Wallapop, ¿sabes? De segunda mano. Y decías, mamá, ¿qué es esto? Esto es un filete de hígado, que tienes que comer hierro. Y tú lo veías y decías... Pff. Decía, bueno, mejor que chupar una llave inglesa, pues, pues será. Y hemos tenido que tomar productos radiactivos. El flash, el tang. Eso se hacía en Chernobyl. Hemos tomado alcohol, porque tenías fiebre y te daban un chorrito de vino. A mí me han llegado a dar, fíjate Jesús, seguro que os ha pasado a muchos... Un vaso de leche caliente cuando tenía fiebre con coñac. Un cubata de abuelo, pero coño, un cubata. Eh, nos fijaros dónde estaba, si seremos duros, que de premio nuestros propios padres nos daban cigarrillos de chocolate para que fuéramos ya cogiendo el hábito de fumar, que te subieras de fumar chocolate. Fíjate el nivel. Así que despidiéndome ya, que seáis muy felices, os tengo que decir que somos. Lo que no podemos perder, Jesús, es la felicidad. Un dato solo, somos el país más feliz del mundo y esto se demuestra, fijaros, os lo voy a demostrar, ¿vale? Somos un país, habéis visto los países nórdicos, por ejemplo, que tienen una noche de seis meses y no sale nadie. Nosotros, nos pasa eso de una noche de seis meses y hacemos un botellón de medio año. ¿Tú te imaginas Jesús ahí acumulado diciendo, ¿cuándo volvéis? ¿Cuándo volvéis? Pues cuando amanezca. Así que, que seáis muy felices, que tengáis mucha salud y fuerte ahí a darnos seguridad, Jesús. Muchas gracias. Grande, Dani. Muchísimas gracias a ti por colaborar en, la, en, este, en este evento. Y muchísimas gracias a toda la audiencia también por acompañarnos. Muy amables. Muchísimas gracias. Adiós. Adiós. Felicidad. Vamos allá. Y comprar mucho. Comprar mucho que hagamos estos eventos. Mucha seguridad. Que no os infectéis. Que podáis ir... Con, con toda vuestra seguridad que vayáis como, como los que tenemos anticuerpos, que vayáis así con las aplicaciones, que te digan, uy, esa ap aplicación es peligrosa, me da igual, dime otra más peligrosa que la voy a abrir, que estáis protegido. <risa> Gracias, Dani, muy amable. Chao. Adiós. Hasta luego. Hasta luego. Desconecto, ¿eh? Me da pena, pero... Sí, sí, desconecta, desconecta. <risa> da como pena esto. Además que te dices, ¿quién se va a quedar? Hablarán ahora de qué vas a decir. No, no, no nos vamos a quedar, no te preocupes. Nadie quiere ser el último, nadie quiere salir el último de una cosa de estas. Nadie quiere, es como, ¿y si salgo el último? No voy a ser el último, ¿sabes? Bueno, me voy a ir. Un abrazo muy, muy fuerte. Venga, igualmente. Chao. Adiós.